Hi, I'm Mark Yaxley. Welcome back to Inside the Vault. Very excited. Today we're sitting down with Wall Street veteran, macro investor, co-founder, and CEO of Real Vision Group, Mr. Raul Pal. Raul, first of all, thank you so much for taking the time to join us today. It's an honor and a privilege to have you back. Yeah, I was here in the early days when there was nothing here and then when there was some stuff here and it's great to see such a success going on here. It's amazing. Well, thank you. Thank you. We look forward to hearing your thoughts today. I wanted to start um, for the benefit of our viewers who might not yet be familiar with you personally, what you've built at Real Vision. Uh, just walk us through the early years of your career in the finance industry. Yeah, look, I was really lucky in my, <clears throat> in my career. I, mean, I came out of a kind of crappy university. It was the only university that would take me. And uh, I came into, I had a choice to try and decide what career I wanted. It was 1990 and there was a banking recession. Mm. And I'd just seen all of that kind of 80s boom and everyone driving red Porsches and the film Wall Street and all of that. And I'm like, that looks quite interesting. <clears throat> My father was in marketing. And he was like, you should go into marketing. You know, there's always a good job in marketing. And I, rem I remember it was my father's birthday and there was a friend of his there at this barbecue. And he said, what are you going to do, Raoul? I said, you know, I don't know. I'm kind of thinking about finance because it looks kind of sexy and cool and seems there's lots of money. Or my dad says marketing. That's really interesting as well. And the guy said, it's really easy, Raoul. He said, you can go and work for Mars in marketing and you'll get free Mars bars. Or you can go and work for a bank and get free money. I was like, okay, that's an interesting way of looking at it. So I managed to beg my way into the industry via a circuitous route for working for a company called Tellerate, which was, if you remember the film Wall Street, those green screens before Bloomberg was okay. Tellerate. So I worked in that business, uh, doing customer support, then training people in technical analysis, and then going to sales. And I had a very quick career there, and then managed to talk my way into what was probably the most prestigious firm in the UK at the time called James Capel, um, on the equity derivative desk, which was a very new thing at the time, stock index derivative, futures and options. Um, and my boss left after six months. And so I was lucky, I was the only man around. They went, okay, well, you're promoted, you run the business. So I was only six months in, I was running this business. And that's the time the hedge fund business was starting, early 90s. Okay. So I started speaking to hedge funds. And it was also at the time when people like Jim Rogers used to be writing for the Barons Round Table. Mm -hmm. And also, um, he wrote a book called Investment Biker, where he went around the world and kind of looked at the opportunity set of these countries and said, decided whether he was going to invest or not. That was the beginning of macro investing. And I realized that's how my brain worked. I thought, oh yeah, this is exactly what I love. Right. And so I started, ended up starting to speak to a few macro funds. And then um, I moved firm to NatWest, the big UK bank. And there I got to know everybody from Paul Tudor Jones to Stan Drucker Miller to um, Soros, all of these people. Mm -hmm. And I was speaking to them on a daily basis. And that was then, that period was a relatively quiet period. Yes, 1994, the kind of uh, blow up in the bond market. So I started to really understand what was going on. But then I left, I got poached by Goldman Sachs, by the partner who ran equity derivatives at Goldman Sachs, to say, come and start the hedge fund business at Goldman, wow. which was a hell of an opportunity. Amazing. And I could, you know, I've still got the rejection letter of Goldman when I left university. They were never going to take me. <laughs> but there I was being given this gift of an opportunity because I knew most of the hedge funds and nobody else did at that point in Europe. And so I turn up at Goldman and I've got a phone book to allow me to call anybody in the world. And so I just got this period. And then the Asian crisis happened. So I'm in the epicenter of everything going on, at the firm at the epicenter of everything going on, with the clients at the epicenter of everything going on. And so that's how I kind of cut my teeth in the macro world. I kind of figured out how you had to join the dots between where you are now to where you are in the future. And macro investing is all about thinking about the future mm -hmm. and then going back to here. So that whole part of the career was really interesting and then I got invited in 2000 I was fearing a crash coming and I got invited by the largest hedge fund firm in Europe GLG partners to go and join them and start the global macro fund so I built the whole hedge fund business at, at Goldman from me mm -hmm. to the most profitable business at in Goldman in equities Congratulations. thank you and then and then moved to um, and then moved to run a global macro hedge fund um, and then did that for several years, then decided to opt out of the rat race and go for the lifestyle choice and move to Spain. Okay, well, I was going to ask you, what, 
what were some of the key takeaways from that period of time in your life? I mean, speaking to all these important people, learning how to evaluate the markets from this macro view, just an abundance of information. What lessons did it teach you? You know, as a, still a relatively young guy, I know you retired when you were 36, so yeah. you were still. You know. Yeah, I mean, first thing, is my little start in technical analysis proved to be the gateway to everything. Okay. Because when I started speaking to people like Paul Tudor Jones, he's like, Ral, everything starts with a chart. Mm -hmm. Everything, all human behavior, everything, all the sum of all information is in that chart. And there's a probabilistic outcome of what may be lie in the future. Mm -hmm. So if you see a chart that's interesting, then go and find the story. Okay. So then you can scan a hundred markets instantaneously by looking at charts. Okay. The other way around mm -hmm. is to try and read hundreds of newspaper articles and hundreds of web articles or whatever to try and find something interesting. No, the chart will lead you the way, then do your homework. And if you can marry technicals and fundamentals, then you've got a real story. That was one of the key things, but I didn't know at the time about building an investment framework. I saw it immediately in the Asian crisis when I was seeing the st trade stand Drucker Miller was doing. He's probably the greatest investor of our lifetimes. You know, 35% annualized return, never had a down year in his history. You know, it's crazy. Um, and the Asian crisis started, and the first trade Stan would put on would be Euro dollars. So that's betting on the interest rate, short term interest rates, i.e., the Fed were going to cut rates. Mm -hmm. Then he starts moving out into other areas. So he starts then betting on copper, betting on gold, betting on currencies, betting on equity markets. And he would layer on bets as the story developed and the probabilities got better. Because when you get to stock markets, they move around the least compared to the macro fundamentals and interest rate rates move the most compared to macro fundamentals. Okay. So you would start with interest rates and then later you get into the equity market. So I learned all of these things about that. And then obviously running a macro hedge fund was then learning about trade construction, portfolio construction, and understanding how not to lose your ass in the whole <laughs> situation. So is it safe to say when you're evaluating either you know a potential pitfall or an opportunity on the other side of that, that you're starting your homework with charts? Is that kind of your go-to? You're looking for indicators in the charts? Always. Okay. So firstly, the chart, but also I also have an understanding of the business cycle. Where we are in the business cycle, i.e. Is the, is the economy that you can show a child the chart of, let's say, US GDP, mm -hmm. and they'll say, well, it goes up and down. Mm -hmm. Most economists have a linear extraction of GDP, which is, we'll never have a recession. Oh, look, we've got a recession. I'm like, a child can tell it does that. Right. The point being is you need to understand when it's doing this bit mm -hmm. and how long that will take. The how long is the hardest part. The peak is the easiest part to see when the trough is or the rise back up again. Right. So I spend a lot of time looking at that to understand where we are. Like right now when we're filming this, in, in um, February 2020, what we're seeing is the business cycle is very slow. So things like the ISM survey in the US are around 50, which is the kind of dividing line between growth and um, contraction. Mm -hmm. So we're slow and across the world we're seeing the same thing. So you know there is a propensity for certain assets to move a certain way. Generally, when the economy gets slower, bonds do well and equities do less well. Right now we've kind of got an equity blow off top. Then when you understand that and the big cycles, the big cycle like the debt super cycle, then you get to understand the value of things like precious metals, where they lie in the cycle. Mm. Um, and when you get the confluence of all events, when you've got the charts, the big cycle, the short cycle, is when you get the really good signals. And, that's those, and then often there's a catalyst. Now, it may be, the catalyst may have been trade tariffs, or it may be the coronavirus, right. things that change the shape of what's happening and increase the probabilities of something different. Thank you, amazing, I love it. Taking a step back now though, I mean, you've been doing this a long time, you have probably the time and the day to do this, to research, and, and you know where to look for the information, but put yourself in the shoes of a younger guy, mm -hmm. you know, 30 years old, just starting to accumulate his wealth, wants to put that money to work, doesn't know much about the markets. Where does a person like that start? Should they try to undertake this education themselves? Should they farm it out to a professional? What would your advice be to a younger I guy? I think, firstly, there's two types of people. There's people who are detail people who want to know everything. So those guys should choose the one thing that interests them and learn about it. 
and then see how it fits into the next thing because their learning curve will take them on that progression to understand how it all fits together. Because macro, what I do, is the world's biggest 3D jigsaw puzzle that's always changing. And you solve it for brief minutes and then it disappears again, you have to start solving it again. Yeah. So those guys can do it from the bottoms up. It's harder, so they tend not to be in macro. Macro, like me, tend to be big picture thinkers who see things visually. Because in your head you're thinking that moves to that and that goes to that and that goes to that. So with something like that, storytelling is everything. Mm -hmm. So start with a book like Investment Biker by Jim Rogers and see how somebody thinks. Soros on Soros is a great book on that too. Um, and Market Wizards. Those kind of books show you how people think. So you've got a framework of understanding of how to think about things. And then see something, let's say it's the coronavirus, and you start asking yourself, well, what does this mean? The mistake most people will make, everybody has to make, is they always see the first order effects. Mm -hmm. What you need to look at is, okay, what happens next mm -hmm. and next? Because the real money is to be ahead of everybody else. Right. Um, so that's, so I think it depends what type of person you are and apply your own skill sets then to that. Okay, okay, great. And if you're, if you're not a detail-oriented person at all, I mean, is, is it even worth investing the time in trying to educate yourself or go and do this? Or yeah, there's I just some people that, that won't get it no matter what. The, the macro is just too much, it's too difficult. That's possible, and there's other parts of the investing world that they can apply their own skill sets to. It doesn't have to be macro. Mm. It could be there's a particular sector you like, something you're interested in. Maybe you're interested in gaming. Okay, well then, apply what you know, what's interesting to you. Maybe you're interested in Bitcoin. Well, find out about it and how that fits into the world, and what you'll find is that journey of learning, that rabbit hole, will extend your knowledge base naturally. Well, I'm glad you, you brought up Bitcoin, because you tweeted something recently that really caught my attention. I follow your tweets on a daily basis, but this one really jumped out. I actually stopped. I think I reached out to a friend and said, like, did you see this? Did... You said something to the effect that if you could own one asset for the next decade, it would be Bitcoin. Yeah. And I'd, I'd love to understand the rationale, the reasoning behind well, that. Two things. So let's take that same 30-year-old and you've got 10 years. You're now in your, the stage where you start really trying to create wealth or save some money for future retirement, whatever it may be, getting married, all that stuff. So you have an equity market, there's all-time high valuations. You have a fixed income market, yes, you can make money if you know what you're doing, but yields are low, so holding it for extended periods of time is not an option. Property markets are too expensive for anybody to afford. So what are you left with? Well, credit markets, well, you don't really get access to those anyway, they're more for professionals, and guess what? There are all-time record valuations as well. So you're stuck with everything that is normal at all-time record valuations. Right. So what are you left with? You've got commodities. Okay, so if you're looking at industrial commodities, well, you need to know what you're doing because these things are massively cyclical and you can get killed in them. Mm. So then you're left with precious metals and Bitcoin that potentially have an upside that's different. Now, why is it different? Why is it important? Because, and I'm sure we'll talk a bit about this, is the environment that we're potentially going into with a, a massive wave of baby boomers retiring, um, with record debts, and governments are going to have to, and central banks are going to have to figure out how to stimulate economies, which are slow anyway, but when you've got this aging population, they don't spend money. If I look at my father's spending patterns after he retired, it probably fell 70%. Mm. Well, that's big for 76 million people in the US alone. So what happens is it slows down economies, there's too much debt for slow economies, it can become a problem, central banks need to print more money to try and keep this thing going, and essentially it ends in complex outcomes. Um, and we don't really know what those outcomes are, but usually they end up in some sort of massive loss of capital for a lot of people, mm -hmm. um, or a transfer of capital and, and losses. So that kind of thing is interesting. We also know we've got a really screwed up financial system. It never really recovered from 2008. We've still got too much debt. We've still, you know, the European banks are a problem. You know, Canada is going to have problems with its banking sector because it lent too much to the property market. We've got problems on top of problems. We've got leverage on top of leverage. The world has never been more leveraged before. Mm -hmm. So how do you step outside of that? Right. And again, there's Bitcoin and gold. There's two obvious answers. Are they the future of money? Well, gold is a money and it's been a money for a very long time. So that's kind of obvious. And yes, will gold do well? Do I own gold? Yes. Do I think it's going up? Yes. Bitcoin is different. Bitcoin is, an enti is a basically, think of it as a, an option on a future financial system. Mm -hmm. And it's not just a financial system. Everything is going digital. 
and Bitcoin and the blockchain and digital currencies and all of this world is like a parallel system that's sucking in the smartest people I've ever met. And they're all going to develop stuff here mm -hmm. because what they're saying is that system can be bettered. And what Bitcoin is all about and that whole movement, and Bitcoin is just the flagship of it, mm -hmm. is a trusted ownership of anything. And as some, a friend of mine called it the security truth machine because everything is recorded by numerous parties. Mm -hmm. Basically, you get rid of all of the issues of the financial system of who owns what. And can people take your assets away from you and all of that kind of stuff. It also opens up the new world. So gamers and people who are younger understand that digital assets have value. Well, right now, digital assets are hard to transfer around. But once you start getting to tokenization and crypto and digitize it, the whole world is different. And that's why, if I look, skate to where the puck is going, as a Canadian would say, <laughs> the puck is going to something new. And we know digital is everything. As Mark Andreessen said, software is eating the world, and it is. And digitization is eating the world too. So as we go to digitization, you need digital money. I often ask myself, because we're in the gold business, is gold a product that can continue to be relevant for a younger generation? And of course we hope so. And there are digital versions of gold and trading platforms and you can buy it on your mobile phone. So there are tools allowing younger generations that are more comfortable with that type of technology, but perhaps Bitcoin and the blockchain embraces it and speaks to them more because directly. Everyone gets confused about the technology of Bitcoin. It's too complicated for anybody to understand. And the possible futures of what you can build with this stuff is impossible for anybody to understand. But does anybody know the molecular structure of gold? No, people don't, it's, it's irrelevant. Mm. With gold, yes, I think there will always be a place because there always has been a place. Mm. You know, there's always been young generations, whatever. Right. There's always been new technologies. But gold's largest future probably lies with other countries just because so many countries have it intrinsically as part of their culture. Mm. So that's not going away. And Yes, Indians will use digital currencies. They're, they've already got this incredible digital payment system where you can pay with a fingerprint for a pint of milk. That's already happening in India. Still hold gold. Right. So, so there, is, there is room for both in the future, course, absolutely. And that's what we try to tell is. people as well. But when you say, okay, what is the risk-reward upside? Well, Bitcoin's probably 50x, 100x. Mm. Well, gold maybe 5x, 10x. Yeah. The downside for gold is less. Bitcoin, well, it's not 100% anymore, but even if it's 50% and it goes up a hundred, uh, you know, um, a hundredfold, well, the risk reward is so skewed in favor of cryptocurrency. Well, you did say in your tweet, you're only picking one, so we're not. We're and not that was the point. Yeah. And I said, you know, gold guys, I don't, it's not like I, I don't you like. slid it in there at the end that's just to right. keep us happy. Because everyone's going to, but what about gold? I'm like, the question was, what is the one asset that's going to give you that return? Fair enough. Sticking with precious metals for just a minute, palladium and rhodium, are yeah. now the most valuable precious metals in the world. Yeah. You know, rhodium had a run about a decade ago, went over $10,000 an ounce, crashed to $900. Interestingly, rhodium has a run at the end of every bull market. I don't know what it is. I don't know enough about the rhodium market, but it seems to be incredibly cyclical with the final points of bull markets. Right. Uh, and you would see this from the charts. Again, maybe that goes back to what you were saying. Somebody you showed me that chart. I'm like, okay, I get it now. Yeah. <laughs> it's very cyclical and it does it at this point. Right. So, and it's when it turns over is again, and yet another sign that we're ending the cycle. Palladium, I don't know, but we do know that there's a massive move towards environmental investing mm -hmm. and palladium has a role within that. So it's probably speculation based, based around that. I don't really know. It's not, they're not markets I really follow Mm -hmm. particularly well but yeah I've noticed that a lot of a lot of people don't and they're really small markets as well yeah very specialized their application being catalytic converters mostly so exactly you could you could take a deep dive into it if, if you'd like to and but I, my question for you is more just from your experience again in, in studying markets and you've obviously seen a lot of bubbles in a, a lot of different places over the years when you see an asset like rhodium again make a journey from nine hundred dollars to ten thousand dollars it's a bubble so I've generally in commodities, generally I've noticed 1,200% is kind of the range. So the gold bull market of the 70s into the 80s, about 1,200%. You know, when you're seeing something like that, it's about the same. You know, you start thinking, no, enough. Anything goes up tenfold in commodity world, there is always supply or there's an exchangeability that you can convert to something else. Mm -hmm. 
So, you know, if you look at the history of gold, they compare it to other assets, real estate, equity markets, oil, things like that, and copper. Mm -hmm. And what you realize is there's a substitution effect because let's say the price of gold is at all-time record highs versus farmland, well, people who own a lot of gold will end up buying farms mm -hmm. because they're cheap assets and you can get a lot for your money because there is a relative pricing of, mm -hmm. of, of these long-term assets. So, you know, I, I think that's why they never run forever. Well, thanks for your, your opinion on that one as well. I know it's a tough one. I, I've asked that question about palladium and rhodium a bunch of times. And most people don't know. You're like, oh, you know what? I just don't know enough. And even tells you guys in our industry as well. It kind of tells you bubble, right? Yeah, yeah. Maybe so, right? And the price, it's going up $200 Although a day. Although the but. best bubbles have a great narrative. Because that's when, like the so, Bitcoin bubble of 2017. So let me ask narrative. you that question. Was Bitcoin a bubble? I mean, yes. what we saw in 2017. Yes, but you know, if you think about the Microsoft share price, the Apple share price, the Amazon, they've all done this. Mm -hmm. Now, if you think of Bitcoin at the simplest terms as a share on the future of a financial system, well, you're going to have these roller coaster ride bubbles until eventually you get mass adoption and the volatility slows down. Right. So, yes, it was a bubble. I do expect it to go through the previous highs in the next 18 months, 12 months. Wow. But with Bitcoin, you could do it in a week. You know, <laughs> you have no idea. Right. Um, but I do, I do expect that to happen. Okay. Well, let's talk a little bit about the U.S. A lot of our viewers are Americans. Mm -hmm. We saw the Fed cut rates three times in 2019. A lot of analysts are saying it's already baked in the cake that there's going to be another rate cut in 2020. Mm -hmm. Where do you see that trend ending? I mean, are we heading towards neutral or negative interest rates in the United States? Well, I just saw a chart last week. I mean, I've been very bullish on interest rates. I interest rate yields are going to fall. I think they're going to zero. Mm -hmm. If you look at the entire list of the developed world, the US is the highest yielding currency on earth, the US dollar. Mm. That's never, ever been the case. That's unsustainable. It's going to cripple the US economy over time from a strong dollar mm -hmm. um, and also flight of capital into the bond market as opposed to the, into other productive uses of capital. So I think the Fed are going to have to cut to zero or cut 25 base points, whatever it is. I don't think the US is able to go negative, and I think they'll try other stuff before they go negative. Okay. Just because the Europeans can deal with negative rates, but America is a highly kind of speculative economy. Always is, it still has that frontier mentality, mm -hmm. and negative money, people just can't get their heads around. <laughs> In Europe, you know, the gold world understands negative money because there's a cost of storing gold, right. but it's worth it from the future expected value of gold. Right. But people don't understand that with, with interest rates. Now, if prices around the world are falling and bond yields are, or prices of assets are falling as well, that double, you know, physical prices, i.e. deflation and assets falling, well, if it costs you half a percent to own a German Bund, great investment. Of course. And if it goes to negative half percent to negative one percent, you'll have made capital gains as well. So, so I, know, I know it sounds crazy, it's a crazy world, but it is what it is. And speaking again of the US, and you used the 2021 timeline earlier, Recession in the U.S. by the end of 2021? In your yeah. mind? Yes, I think it's this year. This year? I think this coronavirus is going to tip the U.S. into recession. Okay, let's talk through that. Um, the world was slow. Global trade is negative right now. Global trade is never negative except in a recession. We're basically at the edge of a global... We're in the global manufacturing and global trade recession. Not there yet for services recession. But we're pretty much as slow as you're going to get. Mm. All the indicators are extremely low and the U.S. itself... Um, is seeing the tail end of its business cycle. We're talking about the Fed cutting rates again, potentially. Trade tariffs are eating in the economy. It's forcing companies to change their supply chains from getting their phone parts manufactured in China. They have to move it to somewhere else. Where? I don't know. So they stop spending mm -hmm. until they pay McKinsey or KPMG to tell them what to do. <laughs> it takes two years. You know, it's a really, this is a big thing that's going on, this trade tariffs. Mm -hmm. So that shocked everybody. And then the coronavirus comes along and it starts in China and everybody cares. Mm. And then it starts spreading and at the time of talking, it's like 22,000 people mm. and the rate is exponential and the number of deaths are over 500 and it's only gonna grow and it's spread to country after country. Mm. Now, what was interesting about the coronavirus is the Chinese know how bad it is. So the outside response is to lock down 60 million people. Mm. Anybody who left Wubei, um, Hubei province 
has been tracked down because they have tracking data on everybody in China, tracked down and quarantined. That's the magnitude. 90,000 flights have been stopped. So there is factories are closed. I mean, China is shut down, schools are closed, everything's closed. Mm. They're talking about closing schools for another month. I mean, how do people go back to work when their kids are, right. their, their kids are at home? So, so we've There got, is no plan for this kind of thing. I mean, obviously they the have plan plans on paper, but... Stop the spread of it, do anything you can, right. because the last thing the Chinese want is social unrest that the government didn't stop this. Mm. So the Chinese are an outside response. So now you're Singapore, Japan, wherever else it's spreading, and it's spreading everywhere, mm. is what do you do? You're now a democratic nation. You can't lock down your country as much as they can. Mm. But if you want to stay in power, you're going to have to do something big because what you don't want to do is upset people because they won't vote for you. Right. And when it's, even though the probability of us being affected is low, the cataclysmic outcome of, oh my God, if this is a pandemic, is so big in people's minds and government's minds, they will do anything to stop it. So we're seeing clo schools closing down, borders closing down, flights being shut down, trade being shut down. That's a huge event for the world. And this is, we're only, we're about a month in. Mm -hmm. Well, it looks like we've probably got three, four, five more months of this. We don't, we have no idea. We don't even know if it's seasonal. Like um, SARS was a seasonal virus. Mm -hmm. So as soon as the world warmed up, SARS disappeared. Right. We don't even know that about this virus. So we have no idea what will curtail it yet. So we have to see the growth rates abroad and everything else. But the point being is everybody is traveling less. Even I'm thinking, do I really want to go to New York this week? Not that there's not that there's a problem in New York. I got an email this morning from a client in New York that said, did you know that there's some reported cases in Chinatown in New York City? And whether it be true or not, the news is now out there. So people aren't going to Chinese restaurants around the world because they now think Chinese people, well, there could be a risk. Right, so this is the m mentality of self-preservation and the kind of madness of crowds and governments have to overreact because if they don't imagine if it is a pandemic um, so that's why i think it's easy to tip a slow economy into recession so i think it's coming i think it's probably in two phases i think we'll hit a mild recession this year caused by this and then i think we're going to see enormous fiscal stimulus coming in by both parties promise for the elections so the market's going to take that as the hopes and dreams. And then after that, we'll see. And my guess is it'll be a false dawn and we'll have a much larger recession in 2021. So I think we're in that process now. I think we started that process in 2019 when the Fed started cutting rates. Um, and I think, you know, I think we're going to be playing with this whole scenario out to maybe 2023. Raul, I'd like to do a quick rapid fire game with you. It is your birthday. So we might as well have a little bit of fun with you. Okay. There's no wrong answer. Okay. You don't have to justify anything. Right, all right. Okay. So I'm going to say, would you rather? Okay. Would you rather gold or silver? Gold. Platinum or palladium? Platinum. Oil or natural gas? I hate them both. <laughs> I think that gas is going to zero, so I'll have to take gold. Uh, oil. Okay. Treasuries or corporate bonds? Treasuries. Dollar or pound sterling? Dollar. Euro or pound sterling? Euro. Dollar, euro. Dollar. Okay. You did well. <laughs> Thanks, Ralph. Finally, I'd like to talk to you a little bit about Real Vision. Mm -hmm. uh, I have to say, as someone in the industry, um, I think it's very innovative. Uh, it's very educational. But I wanted to understand in your own words, what is Real Vision? Where did it come from? And ultimately, what is the value for people who watch your content. Yeah, I'll give you, we used to call it the Netflix of finance because mm -hmm. it was a very kind of catch-all term. But I think what it really is, is the economist of the video age. It's where you go to figure out what the hell's going on. And like the economist, we don't have bylines. We don't have journalists. What we do is like this. We interview people and let them talk. Mm -hmm. We just happen to have a network of the world's most famous investors and the smartest people and the smartest strategists. I mean, it's incredible who we get on. I mean, we talked about Stan Druckenmiller. Stan Druckenmiller gave us 90 minutes of his time mm -hmm. telling us what he thinks about the world, how he thinks about investing. I mean, this stuff is, I mean, priceless. And Real Vision's priced for nothing. It's 180 bucks. But what you get out of one interview alone is worth thousands of dollars. So why do we do that? What is this all about? It's all about democratizing the very best financial intelligence. Because I grew up at the epicenter of the financial system, right? I was the hedge fund guy. I was the Goldman Sachs guy, right? 
I knew everybody. I was at the inner circle. And I write the Global Macro Investment, which is my research service that I write, and it's extremely expensive, aimed at all those same guys at the epicenter of the system who could afford to pay those kind of rates for the kind of analysis I produce. But in 2008, and I'd been writing about this, and all these guys in the big short and all that, they were clients of mine. We knew what was going on. But friends of my parents didn't, and friends of friends didn't. They come up to me and say, why don't we know? I was like, hmm. Well, obviously the banks can't tell you. They've got their own shareholders to protect. But why didn't the media tell you? Mm -hmm. The media were too busy cheerleading, and then they had their corporate sponsors, and they couldn't and didn't. And they have a fiduciary duty. You have to... You can't pretend risk is not there. And they did. And then they were too late. And then they created panic in themselves. So I just thought this is not right. The average guy deserves better. They deserve better. They shouldn't have to have, you know, $200 million of net worth and be a Goldman Sachs, UBS, whatever client and get access to this. It's not right. So then I reached out to some friends of mine. So we kind of realized that video was going to be the future of everything. Mm -hmm. It's the future of communication. And, you know, in that journey with the four, three other co-founders, we decided to set this business up, not having done anything before uh, in terms of video. But we reached out to some of these famous hedge fund guys said, listen, would you fancy being on Real Vision? They said, you know, what's Real Vision? <laughs> First question. Then we said, listen, we're going to give you free reign to talk about anything. And it's long form, not short form, because short form financial stuff, it's crazy. It's too important. Mm -hmm. So we want long form and subscription-based service. So it's not all about advertisers. And they're like, yeah, this sounds amazing. Nobody's ever asked us to do this before. And we turned all these guys into rock stars. And all these analysts into rock stars and unknown people. We just found the smartest people in the world and said, talk to us what's in your mind. Mm -hmm. And so for a cheap subscription price now, people get access to the kind of information they've never had before. And it's not the guy, the blogger on the internet where you can't verify it. These are people with skin in the game, mm -hmm. famous, well-respected right. people. So it's a game changer for everybody, me included. The access that we get, the kind of information that we get is, is like, it's mind blowing. And so it's only gonna get better is what you're saying. Yeah. yeah. It's only going to get better. And that's why I use The Economist of the Video Age. Because The Economist is the one thing, there's 1.6 million people subscribe to The Economist, because they know it will make them smarter. You may not read it all the time, but you know when you need to know what's going on, there'll be an article about what you need to know that's there. And it's not news. We don't do news, because news is everywhere. I get my news from Twitter now. I don't read news anywhere else. Mm. If there's a great FT article, it'll be on Twitter. You know, I don't need to actually buy any newspapers. So analysis, that's different. You can't get analysis. So that's what it's all about. It's helping people by bringing them the best information in the world. And are you still based here in Cayman? Is that a... Yeah, we're a Cayman Islands company. We, we are employee number one came from Little Cayman. Employee number two came from Little Cayman. And for people who don't know about Little Cayman, it's an island of 140 people <laughs> where I happen to have a house. So our first two employees were there. It's founded here, built here. The headquarters are here. I still run it from here. Yeah, we've got... 50, 60 people in New York, people in London, people in Texas, people in California, but we've got people all over now. But we're based here, I run it from here, I live here. That's great. Well, I wanted to speak about Cayman a little bit because we're a Caymanian company as well, proud to be one. Brexit, you know, it, made, it, it has to make people on this island a little bit nervous because there's a little bit of uncertainty as to what might happen in Cayman. And I wanted to ask you because, you know, being a guy who lives here, uh, you have an you know, English background, obviously, so it must you know, pull on a few of your strings. And have you given any thought to our little islands? And Will it go unaffected? Will, should we be worried at all? It depends how far political change goes across the world. The haves and the have-nots mm -hmm. and that gap closing. Mm -hmm. That is coming. And it depends how they're going to treat corporations and others who use uh, tax-free jurisdictions. Mm -hmm. But that's not Cayman's business, really. That's, um, that's Ireland, who actually does a lot of that stuff. It's Delaware. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of... A, what Cayman does is interesting. Cayman is a tax-neutral jurisdiction because you're a Canadian, I'm an Englishman, and we want to invest in a fund in German real estate. Right? We've got complications with who pays tax to Germany, who pays tax to England, blah, blah. So you set it up in Cayman, you pay tax to Canada, I pay tax to England, nobody pays tax to the Cayman Islands. Mm. Right. That's tax neutral. That's the genius of the Cayman Islands. What also came out of the Cayman Islands was a lot of intellectual brain power from the legal 
and accounting community. Absolutely. So some of the smartest people in those industries mm -hmm. are here mm -hmm. developing. That's why cryptocurrency came out of here. That's what the VC industry, I mean, everything comes out of here because they need to solve the problems for global investors. So, you know, I think the hedge fund industry is dying. So they're going to lose that business over time. Mm. But they started the whole crypto digitization, tokenization, basically was invented here. Mm. Oh, we've got some in the vaults. Yeah, we know a little bit about it. Yeah. 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 So there's some really interesting stuff mm -hmm. that's come out of here. So, you know, the whole rise of PE. Well, the Cayman Islands did that. So when the hedge funds were shrinking, the PE went through the roof. Well, they made money from that too. Mm -hmm. Venture capital, they've got that too. So whatever's coming, they will still be pay a part of it. Will, so will corporations, will, you know, big oil companies be able to have a shell company here? Probably not. Right. Will it make a difference? Probably not because so many other reasons to do it. Will they lose their tax-free status? No, because they're an independent country. So yes, they're a British overseas territory and they have the benefit of the British legal system at the very high level, but essentially they're an independent country so they can choose to have zero tax. And zero tax is the only advantage that Cayman has. And it's not right. for, as you know, having lived here, it's not about people hiding money. Not at all. Sure, there's a few wealthy Canadians and blah, blah, who've retired, who, who, you know, who want to live on the beach. Well, it's a good place to live for that, and then you don't pay tax. But really, there's, you never meet those people. They never say, oh, well, I've moved here for tax reasons. They go and live in Monaco, and they don't live there properly, all of that. It's a very different world than here. Right. People actually come here to live here because the quality of life's pretty good. Well, a lot of people come here to work. I mean, a lot of young professionals, very bright entrepreneurs. We've seen well, most of, of the people here are just professionals. Mm -hmm. It's becoming much more entrepreneurial. Mm -hmm. It's an entrepreneurial society. It's got that bit of a frontier feeling of I can do anything, which is why this gold vault, you know, when I heard that you, because I was looking at setting up a gold vault, heard that you guys, are, forget it, you've done an amazing job. I can't do it better. It's that entrepreneurial, right? That spirit is here in the Cayman right. So I don't, that's not going away. Yeah, I've seen it growing as well. It's even from the small businesses across the way, you know, local people, opening up these coffee shops, restaurants, tech, everything. And, and the next generation of Caymanian kids, really bright. I mean, if we can build a global media business yeah. out of this salty hot rock, <laughs> it's unbelievable, right? right? I mean, five and a half million people watched our videos a couple of months ago. We'll get back on average two million a month on our free YouTube channel. Mm -hmm. Right, that's coming from here, really. Right. Sure, we've got people around the world, but it's it's a Cayman company. That's it amazing. Here. Yeah, and that's really inspirational. Yeah. I mean, I, I went through the airport a bunch of times and saw, you know, your mugshot on the wall. At the, the it's, it's gone now. I'm now a nobody. It always made me smile. I was like, you know, I remember when you guys were just getting started going to your offices. You know, it was a, yeah. it was a startup. And that's and why then, with this business as well, you know, we kind of took pride in it. It's like, great. Yeah. These people are doing something we really care about. Um, here on Ireland, so we'll just be as supportive as possible. And we've all both in our businesses been supportive of each other because it's like we're all part of the same ecosystem, which is this incredible Ireland's given a lot of people opportunities, has a lot of benefits to many people, and it's a great place to do live and work. And, and it's still very scalable. You know, it's not hard for us to meet up for a cup of coffee or have an interview. I don't have to drive an hour and a half through traffic, you know, or what? Yeah, the simple thing is I'm traveling all the time, yeah. 10 minutes to the airport. Right. And you come back from a trip wherever you've been. There's chickens on the tarmac. <laughs> First thing I noticed, I had the, the chicken. Best. I love it. Got the rental car, chicken was right there. I'm like, I'm back, I'm home. It's I good. know, and it's th that's amazing. Yeah. yeah, I can be on a direct flight to London, right. or two flights a day to New York, three flights a day to Miami, you know, Chicago, Chicago Denver. I mean, it's unbelievable. Yeah. And the list is growing. I just yeah. saw Southwest is here now. I mean, there's more and more airlines. The runway is getting longer. Yeah, once they get those, those, um, those uh, maxes back, they. If they ever oh, get their yeah, planes yeah, back, sure, sure. there'll be flights to LA yeah. or San Francisco too. It's going to open up the Asian market. Imagine the real estate then. I mean, it's, it's going to be something else. Anyways, <laughs> Raul, it's been a real pleasure spending time with you today. Thanks again for coming back inside the vault with us and uh, look forward to seeing you again soon. I thoroughly enjoyed it. Thanks a lot, Great. Mark. Thanks, mate. And happy birthday again. <laughs> Thank you.